All right, so this is sort of, this is the second part of JETS. So this is um, kicking it up a notch, especially because most of my student, students are going to be doing something related to this. So I have used the term JET. I have not really defined a JET. So the idea, at least initially, was that a measurement of a JET was a measurement of a parton. So what you see in these event displays is that you have a whole bunch of um, you have a whole bunch of outgoing particles, and in principle, um, the even as late as the 1990s and 2000s, um, the idea was that if you can just make sure that you get all of those particles. Um, you can measure the properties of the quark itself. Um, so, and indeed, I, I still have heated arguments with one of my close colleagues about this because this is also, this is very much a cartoon picture. This was the idea, but it gets messy. So, here you can see the event display I showed earlier and another one from CMS. Um, <clears throat> the idea was that you would met, if you just group all of the particles correctly, you measure partons and so quarks or gluons. Here you can see um, right here something called a Feynman diagram. So this is showing in theory the way that particles actually go that the quarks and gluons would actually go from um <clears throat> from the initial outgoing quark or anti-quark all the way to the final state hadrons which in this picture are colored yellow and you see a couple things so First of all, there's actually some connections between both of the back-to-back -back jets. So they're not entirely independent of each other. And then the other thing is, if you're talking about at, you know, which particles do you, should you count in the jet, it's not clear where you should draw the line. So maybe you'd want to get all the way here, but then what do you do with these guys? Do these guys belong in jet one or do they belong in jet two? Um, and then what do you do with this guy here? This is a gluon, um, which then would go on to form a hadron. Does that gluon belong in the jet or does it not? This is not um, an easy question to answer. Um, and we also, so this exists, this ambiguity exists even in theory. So um, what you see first, this first part is the parton shower. This is also what we call fragmentation, where that one quark or gluon breaks up into more partons. And it is followed by hadronization, where those um, partons form final state hadrons. Um, and even before you get a detector involved in all of the messiness of measurements, you don't have a very clearly defined threshold between the two different jets. Um, and so what you do in practice is that you come up with algorithms and <clears throat> now the definition of a jet is not actually that you're trying to measure the parton. So you're not saying that your goal is to add up the momentum and energy from that outgoing anti-quark. The goal is to come up with an unambiguous way to group particles into final state, well, group particles into clusters called jets. So actually I'm gonna jump, um, I think I have, yeah. So this is what a jet finding algorithm does. If you're doing it on a theoretical level, then you're putting final state hadrons 
Um, ideally, you'd be putting final state hadrons, so pions, protons, kaons, into your algorithm. And on an experiment, when you're doing it on an experiment, you're putting in tracks cluster, or clusters in a calorimeter. And then the jet finding algorithm just groups them into final state. Into, and it says, OK, I'm going to put these two part of, assume these two particles are the same object, add their momenta, add their energies, and then they make a new object. And I throw out the parent particles. Um, and so this definition of a jet related to a jet finding algorithm is somewhat divorced from the picture of a jet as a parton. We are not trying to measure a parton anymore. We're saying, I'm going to run this algorithm that clusters particles. And if I run the same cluster finder in, um, <clears throat> in proton proton and in heavy ion collision or proton pro in theory and in data i should get the same answer so uh, you want a couple properties you want it to be infrared and collinear safe and what does that mean <clears throat> so collinear safe means that if you have um, if you have one particle that um, is instead split into two, um, you get the same, your, your algorithm will make the same jet. So if you have a five GeV gluon that instead splits into two, two and a half GeV gluons, your jet find that are at ex, pointing in the exact same direction, your jet finder should give you the same answer. The reason for this is that theories, the theoretical calculations are poorly constrained when those two gluons are very close together. Um, so you want your, both your calculation and your measurement to be robust to that because um, you don't want to be sensitive to something you can't calculate well. Um, on the other side, you have infrared safety. So what you want you want, for instance, each particle is in one and only one jet, so that as you go to very low momenta, um, you don't get an infinite number of jets. So theoretically, you can basically always spit off a very, very soft particle. You may not be able to measure it, but if it's sufficiently soft, you probably um, can come up with something that you know your theory your model can do it without making a big difference in the high the, the higher momentum particles i saw that question go by there i'm going to go i'm going to come back to that near the end um, so that is you you don't want an infinite number of jets at low momentum and you want your um, calculations and your measurement to be robust to this thing the theory doesn't measure well. So infrared and collinear safe. So um, that was the outcome of this thing called the snow mass accord that basically instead of thinking of this as partons, we're now thinking of it as the output of a clustering algorithm that is somewhat connected to the idea of a parton, to the idea of a quark or a gluon, but you can no longer, it's not a valid scientific question to ask, you know, you're, you don't measure how good your jet finder is and you're, by comparing the momentum of this jet to the momentum of that anti-quark. That is not a valid scientific question. Okay, so, the summary is of what is a jet. Well, I know it when I see it. Um, that was the I know it when I see it approach was pretty much a summary of what we were doing in the 90s. There were a lot of jet finders that were somewhat, they were experimentally driven. They had a lot of momentum cuts, like you require a particle above 2 GeV and you start forming a cluster there. And they did all sorts of complicated things with when you would split jets and when you would merge them. 
now we have algorithms where you can just um, where you just run a for loop and it's completely unambiguously defined but it has less of a connection to this idea of a jet finder um, if any of you guys so this reference to Potter Stewart that was in of course a pornography case where what is a you know what is pornography I don't know I know it when I see it um, so where could someone find these algorithms you want to look for a software package called FastJet. If any of you guys do something with actual reconstruction of jets, you're going to use FastJet because it is the best implementation of these algorithms computationally. Um, so then the functional definition of a jet is that a jet is what a jet finder finds. A jet is not a parkon. It is the output of this algorithm. So then you have heavy ion collisions. That's how complicated jets are before you even get this messy environment where you have background from other, we still kind of, when we want measure jets, we want to measure this hard scattering, mostly a back-to-back -back scattering. We want to be at least sensitive to what's going on with partons, even if that's not exactly what we're measuring. Um, but now we add this background. So you get combinatorial jet candidates, which basically means um, that you have um, a random combination of particles and we've actually, it really is consistent with a totally random um, grouping of particles. That's not actually what we want to measure. Um, you get energy smearing from the background because there's a bunch of unrelated processes. It's sensitive to the methods that you use to suppress combina these combinatorial jets and to correct the energy. Um, and Experimentally in heavy ion collisions, there has been a focus on narrow and high energy jets. Now there was a question if um, if fast jet has assumptions based on the loon string model. The answer is no. The algorithm, so fast jet is a software package that implements a number of jet algorithms, primarily the four that we actually the four that we are that we are aware of that are both infrared and collinear safe. Um, the one that you will hear of most is in heavy ion physics is this one, which is the anti-KT algorithm. <clears throat> and the anti-KT algorithm um, starts making clusters around a high momentum particle, and it will make roughly circular jets. <laughs> The algorithm itself is not sensitive to any model because it's actually four lines of code, or sorry, four different steps in an algorithm that you, you start by grouping, um, you look at the separation between two particles, you look at the closest particles, and you group them together. And then um, you basically loop over all particles until every particle is in a jet candidate. It is, an ag the jet finding algorithm is sort of an agnostic process. It knows nothing about partons. It just is a step for making these clusters. Um, okay, so now I am going to um, double check with that. I'm still going to come back to the um, the question about Pythia later on. Um, okay, so this is all it does. And I want you to think about this, this language here, jet candidates, is not accidental. So if you're doing anything in heavy ion collisions, you should think about this not as, you know, the output of a jet finder is not a jet. The output of a jet finder is a list of jet candidates. And it groups, so here, this is another slide on jet finders, and here, here I have the KT algorithm in detail, 
what you see on um, what you see right here is what the KT algorithm did to an event with a lot of soft particles called ghosts. <clears throat> and what you see is that the entire area, so this is azimuth and this is pseudorapidity. Again, pseudorapidity is along the beam line. The entire area is covered in jet and jets. The jet finder, a jet finder is going to put every particle in a jet, regardless of whether or not it was related to some type of parton scatter. Um, so here, you know, for all particles, you calculate this quantity, which is a measure of how, um, <clears throat> how far apart the particles are. You look at the smallest one of those and you combine them, except that if <clears throat> at some point you call it its own jet and you throw it out of the list and you repeat that until there's no particles left and all you're left with is a list of jet units. <clears throat> okay, so then um, what you can do is that you can look at your background. So the a way that you can do this is that you can um, well, one way you do this is that you actually run the KT algorithm, which the difference between the KT algorithm and the anti-KT algorithm is whether um, right here, is this PT squared or is it one over PT squared? And then for the, um, Cambridge Aachen algorithm, you just use delta R and you, you don't have PT in there at all. And those are three of the four algorithms that are infrared or collinear safe. And it's just like, you guys could write code that implements this, don't, because the FastJet um, package does this using a bunch of good computational libraries, so it will do it a lot faster. So you're going to use fast jet if you do anything with jets. So one thing you can do is that you can use the KT algorithm. The KT algorithm starts clustering around soft particles. And then you look at the median um, amount of momentum or energy per unit area. And you use that as a measurement of your background. <clears throat> if you do this in a proton-proton collision, your background will be relatively low. This approach was actually developed for proton-proton collisions when you have high luminosity. And what that means is that you have multiple proton-proton collisions happening right on top of each other so that you actually have a large background from totally unrelated proton-proton collisions. This is because when you do studies like looking for the Higgs, you wanna look at very rare processes, whereas for um, studies of heavy ion collisions we're interested in stuff that happens all the time but when you have when you're looking for rare processes you want as many collisions as possible so you can do the best so you are not limited by statistics okay so you do this you can you run the jet <coughs> the kt jet finding algorithm over your event plot the median do this for a bunch of events and you plot the um the background energy density, which is PT, the median PT over area as a function of the multiplicity. So this is just the number of tracks in the event. And you see something like this. So the background is roughly linear depending on the area. Um, the fact that the background, so when you're calculating your actual background, um, you multiply again by the area of your jet. This means that you want to use smaller jets because your background is smaller. The other thing is that the, the width of the distribution of the background energy is smaller if you use smaller jet areas. So 
most jet studies in heavy ions use something, this R is what we call a resolution parameter. It more or less corresponds to the radius if you have a conical jet. <clears throat> um, and if you use smaller R's, you have smaller jets. And that means you have a lower background. And that means that <clears throat> The background level is not actually the important part. What matters is the fluctuations in the background. If you know that you always have an extra 300 GeV in your jet, but it's always 300 GeV, you can still do a good measurement. But if you have 300, it's better to have a, have a larger background, but a smaller, un, that spread in the backgrounds in your jet sample than to have a larger spread. <clears throat> so what we do is that we focus on smaller jets because if you have smaller jets, you have a lower background, you have fewer fluctuations in that background level. That has a physics bias because we know that quark jets, what I mean by quark jets is that the first one of those um, particles in um, in a diagram like this, this guy. If this guy is a quark instead of a gluon, that quark fragments narrower, meaning that the particles are closer to the central jet axis, and there's fewer particles. <clears throat> so if we look at narrow jets we're biased towards quarks and against gluons. And if we look at particles, jets that fragment into high momentum particles, we are also biased towards um, gluons, or quarks rather than gluons. So what we do is that we focus on high momentum. Yeah, another thing we do is we focus on high momentum. So here you can see in a model, um, this is the, um, jet part in the solid line, this dashed line is the hydro part, the hydrodynamical part, so everything but jets, and then there's a line between them that is the sum of the two. You can ignore the, well, the, the pictures are that <coughs> I was, the mouse is what you're looking for, it's a small signal, the elephant is, is your background, and you're looking for something, sometimes you're looking for something in between the two. But what this means, this is the total number of particles. So what this means is that if you only look at high momentum particles, that you are mostly looking at particles from jets. So that's one way to cut your background. The downside is that um, that means that you're not as sensitive to measurements of, of gluons, but it also means that if your parton lost energy in the medium, you might not be looking at it because you're only looking at the part that still looks like a jet. Um, so here you can see the distribution of all, um, <clears throat> this is if you reconstruct jets and look at your and subtract the average background in a heavy ion collision. This is the number of jets as a function of the momentum. And the red shows what you get if you have all jet candidates. The blue shows what you get if you require that those jet candidates have at least a 2 GeV track. The green shows what you get if you require a 5 GeV track, an 8 GeV track, and a 10 GeV track. So what you see is that this, <clears throat> first of all, in the inclusive, a number of your jet candidates, <clears throat> your algorithm will tell you that your jet candidates have negative energy. That means you over subtracted the background. And so you can look at that side and as you require higher and higher momentum tracks, you're suppressing this, um, you're reducing the amount of combinatorial jets, so just random bunches of particles, <coughs> you're mostly you're left with real jets that have a positive reconstructed momentum, 
but you're also you also have a physics bias. So this is where the compromise that you're making is you're accepting the physics bias because it allows you to do the measurement. Because the flip side of this, you might say, okay, well, don't have the track bias because you're looking at a biased result, and that's true, but then you can't correct for these fluctuations in the energy, so you can't do a measurement. So you do the measurement you can. And um, I think I'm gonna, I'll skim through this one. Uh, Atlas does, this is a summary of the approach that Atlas has to their background subtraction where they first reconstruct jets, they use that to estimate the background, they um, then correct the tower, the, the energy of their jets, and then they run the jet finder again. But they have a number of these kinematic thresholds at a bunch of different stages, which also means that you're not looking at all jets, you're looking at a biased sample of jets. So if you <coughs> are trying to understand this in detail, you know, requiring a 7 GeV track doesn't matter much when you are reconstructing a 200 GeV jet, but down here you have, you know, 50, 20, 50 GeV jets. So there it starts to matter a lot, and there you actually see that the measurements are not entirely identical. Um, so here this is zooming in, you can see that discrepancy more. And the reason why I have an army of undergrads helping me implement analyses in this program called Rivet is because then we can do it exactly like the experiments do. And that means that in a model calculation, you could have the same bias that the, um, that the, the measurement does. And then this is just kind of a, this is also a cool result um, on where you can see these are actually jets which are leading, um, which are B quarks or C quarks, at least leading order. So <laughs> you also see separation there. It's kind of cool. Um, that concludes, actually, that was the lecture part. And then now I want to come back and address this question. Um, and let me ask you guys to jump in with more questions as well if you have them. So the question is, don't Pythia and other computational or theoretical models generate jets in a way which is unrealistic? The reason I ask is that a jet detection or clustering algorithm may fail due to looking for the model in many cases. I think it depends on Okay, so are they unrealistic? So Pythia is a simulation for a, a software package for simulating proton-proton collisions. And it now has an option to simulate heavy ion collisions. Um, and it has some features of what we call quantum chromodynamics, which is the gold standard for models for anything um, in when you're trying to calculate um, when you're trying to calculate it's if you can do something using perturbative quantum quantum chromodynamics, that's the best model because we think that it is we still think that it is right from first principles it's just really hard to calculate many things in it um, so Pythia is sort of a hybrid of phenomenological approaches and leading order if you guys are so the first term in a perturbative calculation quantum chromodynamics it then uses fragmentation functions which have been tuned to data, and Pythia has been heavily tuned to a number of models. So Pythia is usually a, 
pretty is usually pretty close to what we actually measure in proton proton collisions. Um, part of that is probably because it gets most of the most important physics right, but you could also say that Pythia roughly matches data because it is um, heavily tuned to the data as well. So um, is it unrealistic? It depends on what you're trying to use it for, which is, I think, a good way to approach models. Um, I have my students play around with Pythia a lot because for anything except, say, heavy flavor, the production of Charm and Beauty Quarks, um, Pythia is usually within about 80% of the right answer. <clears throat> um, if one of my students comes to me and says they did something in Pythia, and that the, a Pythia prediction is an order of magnitude off from what they measured, the calculation or the measurement is wrong in almost all cases. If that you see something that's 10% off, well, that I believe. Um, you have to be, I think that especially if you're looking at measurements of jets, you need to, you should be, um, you should ask critical questions about how people use the model. Um, so a lot of people use Pythia simulations for the, their corrections of the data. And there are things that I think, where I think that's robust. We usually use simulations of Pythia. We pass them through a program called Jayant, and we use that to estimate our single track reconstruction efficiency. This has been studied to death. Um, the single track reconstruction efficiency is not very sensitive to whether your model gets the right number of pions. Um, oh, Pythia also gets strangeness wrong. So don't trust Pythia on anything, but you can trust Pythia roughly on anything that only involves up and down quarks. It's pretty good for that. <laughs> um, if you're talking about running a jet finder over inclusive proton-proton events, Pythia gives you something close to inclusive jets and it's pretty reliable for that. If someone has is talking about identifying quark versus gluon jets and they are using Pythia and Pythia only and they don't have large uncertainties, you should be a little bit skeptical because Pythia only has the first order of quantum chromodynamics and it um, is constrained by the data. And if you track this back, um, we don't have very good measurements that separate quark versus gluon jets. And Pythia is, cannot be better than the measurements. So that was a very long-winded answer to a short question, um, which is why I saved it for the end. Now, there's a question, why quarks have less fragmentation? I would phrase it differently. Quarks fragment into, um, I, yeah, I'm not 100% sure on the theoretical level. Um, I am aware of the measurements. Um, if I think what you're talking about, the way to say it is that on average, so fragmentation, this process where a jet breaks up into first final state partons, followed by hadronization, the final state hadrons. This process is statistical. So it is possible to have a 50 GeV quark jet that leads to a 50 GeV pion, and it is possible to have a 50 GeV gluon jet that leads to a 50 GeV pion. Um, but what you can say is that on average, there are more particles in jets, which are at leading order, gluon jets, and there are 
um, and the distribution of the energy is on average spread over a larger area for gluon jets. Um, I think as for why that happens theoretically, let me see if George can answer that one. All right. So yeah, I'm I'm not an expert on this, but uh, I will give you my my gut guess, and this has to do with uh, quarks. Obviously, are are massless and are color carriers. There's two colors, so they like like to radiate. Right. I, so, I think you said quarks. I think you mean gluons. I mean, yeah, are massless. gluons. Yeah, gluons like to radiate. Sorry, I misspoke. So glue gluon like. Gluons um, interact more easily with the dense dense background uh, than than quarks do. So I think it's they have more chance to radiate than quarks do. But this is sort of my my gut intuition on it. Is that think about like uh, a photon? If you ch change the direction of a photon, it radiates. Right. This is Bremsstrahlung. So now you have the equivalent of this of a of a gluon moving through this color background and it just can interact more easily because it's doesn't have more, it doesn't have a uh, mass. So, and it doesn't have to have, so that means that there's a lot of different quantum mechanical effects, like it's virtuality can be different and all kinds of things can be different about the glue on than the, than the quark. And so the quark sort of has to maintain at least its identity as a flavor. So that, uh, that puts some, extra quantum mechanical restrictions on what it can do. That's, that's sort of my, my take on it. I hope that's helpful. Thanks, George. Okay, so that was kind of dense. Um, if you are an undergrad, I actually expect that that was, it didn't all stick the first time. Let me pause and see if anybody has questions. I am not seeing any, so we are going to 